This is problem 13101, it's on page 753. Air is to be preheated by hot exhaust gases in a cross-flow heat exchanger before it enters the furnace. Air enters the gas exchanger at given properties there at a rate of 0.8 cubic meters per second. The combustion gases enter at different temperature and flow rate, mass flow rate 1.1 kilograms per second and leave at a, another temperature there. The product of the overall heat transfer coefficient and the heat transfer surface area is 1200 watts per degree Celsius. Assuming both fluids to be unmixed, determine the rate of heat transfer. Well, this problem is set up sort of odd, and let me explain to you why I say that. Let's start off by writing, writing down all the different things that are given. I'm going to let the air flow uh, in the, the vertical direction here. I'm going to make some notes. Both fluids unmixed. And the UA product of this heat exchange is 1200 watts per degree Celsius. Notice basically by giving us the UA product, they've given us the size of the heat exchange. Okay, so if the air flows on this side, some of the things I didn't read was that the heat capacity is 1,005 joules uh, per kilogram per degree Celsius on the air side. The air comes in at 95 kilopascals at 20 degrees Celsius at a volume flow rate on the cold side of 0.8 cubic meters per second. This is important because normally we like to deal with mass flow rates, but they give us a volume flow rate here. So we'll have to deal with that a little bit later. The air leaves, and we're not told what temperature the air leaves at, but obviously it should be higher because heat's flowing from the exhaust gases into the air. The exhaust gases, by the way, come in with a heat capacity on the hot side of 1100 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius at 180 degrees Celsius at a mass flow rate on the hot side of 1.1 kilograms per second. This is all just stuff from the problem statement. Those exhaust gases leave at 95 degrees Celsius, so obviously they've given up significant heat. Okay. Now to answer the question, we can actually answer the question very easily. Right? How would we answer the question? question is just the heat transfer rate. Well, if I know the mass flow rate and heat capacity of these exhaust gases and I know how much the temperature changes, I can tell you the heat transfer rate. Right? So let's do that. Now, I'm going to put the calculation up here out of the way because I'll leave it there for a while and we'll compare it to it later. So the heat transfer rate should be the mass flow rate on the hot side times the heat capacity on the hot side. You know what? That's just the capacity rate on the hot side. Why don't we come down here and calculate the capacity rate on the hot side to make our lives easier. So multiply the mass flow rate times the heat capacity. So 1.1 times 1100. And what do you get? Twelve ten. Twelve ten. that's right. So 1210 um, watts per degree Celsius is the capacity rate on the hot side. Can we calculate the capacity rate on the cold side? Almost. We're not quite there yet because we don't know the mass flow rate on the cold side. Let's get the heat transfer rate first and then let's come down and work on the capacity rate on the cold side. So I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use the capacity rate on the hot side multiplied by the temperature change. Well, that's easy. Temperature of the hot stream in less the temperature of the hot stream out. That should give me the heat transfer rate. So <coughs> capacity rate 1210 watts per degree Celsius. Temperature of the hot stream in 180, temperature of the hot stream out 95 degrees Celsius. And what's the heat transfer rate? So 180 less 95 times 1210 gives you how much? Essentially it's 85 times 1210. Uh, Two thousand eight hundred and fifty watts. Okay. So there's the heat transfer. So why did they give us all this stuff if it's that easy? I mean, we kind of short-circuited the problem, right? Well, the reason they gave it to us is because they intend for us to calculate that this is what's really happening, right? But we could compare that to what the manufacturer predicts because we could also 
predict the exiting temperatures, right? This specification here, UA product of 1,200 watts per degree Celsius, is something that would have to come from the heat exchanger manufacturer, something that they would specify as their, their you know, the capability or the capacity of that, that heat exchanger. Now, if you bought a car, and you bought it from, I don't know, GM, Ford, Mazda, whoever, and they tell you that the engine is a 100 horsepower engine, do you think that when you drive it off the lot that that engine will produce 100 horsepower? If you were to put it on a dyno? Probably not. What do you think it would do, more or less? Well, it might do less, but it might do more. I mean, there's going to be some distribution, right? There's going to be some variance. And my guess is it would probably do 100 horsepower or more when it's new, because the manufacturer doesn't want to false advertise, right? So probably it's more like 110 horsepower, right? Now, as the car ages and the seals wear and, you know, you get more blow-by gases, the horsepower output of the engine is going to go down. Now, really, there's probably some variation because it probably needs to be worn in first and the horsepower might actually go up initially, but then start falling off as age comes on. Don't know exactly what that looks like, but the point is there's going to be some variation. Now, when they advertise it at 100 horsepower, they're probably going to make it so that even once the engine is worn in, once it's got a few miles on it, it still produces 100 horsepower so that you'll be a satisfied customer. So my guess is that this is probably a little bit low. So my guess is the temperature's coming out a little higher than what this UA product predicts. So let's go and find out. Okay. Now along the way, we'll also find out the exiting temperature. Notice, now that we have this heat transfer rate, we can actually say what the actual temperature of the air coming out is, assuming no loss. Now if this heat exchanger has some heat loss, as well as the heat transfer to the air, then obviously this temperature wouldn't reach quite as high. But just for the sake of argument, I'm going to change the 95 degrees to a different color. So remember that this is, this is our, our measured actual performance. And what we're going to do is assume that this is a good industrial heat exchanger. Because if you start looking at the size of this heat exchanger, this is a pretty good size heat exchanger. That, that 102 kilowatts is a pretty good transfer rate. For, for, for relation or for, for a feel of similarity, your house probably uses five kilo, anywhere from one to five kilowatts continuously. So a hundred of those, that's, that's a pretty good size. It's not huge, but it's not small either. It's not something you're going to find at your house, okay? unless you're doing something really big. So let's calculate the exiting temperature. And this will be the actual exiting temperature, right? How would we do that? Well, to calculate the exiting temperature, we'd have to say that the heat transfer rate from the exhaust is the same as the heat transfer rate into the air. So basically what we need to do is say, well, then this is equal to the capacity rate on the cold side times the temperature change on the cold side, right? But we don't have the capacity rate on the cold side yet, so let's get that. Notice to get the capacity rate on the cold side, we need the mass flow rate on the cold side times the heat capacity on the cold side. The heat capacity on the cold side is no big deal. That was given, but we were not given the mass flow rate. How can we get the mass flow rate? Well, the mass flow rate on the cold side would be the density of the air times the volumetric flow rate. Fortunately, we were given the volumetric flow rate on the cold side, but how do we get the density of the air? Do we go to the back of the book and just look it up? No, yeah, that's actually... Pressure. What's that? We have the pressure, so shouldn't we? We do have the pressure. Is the air behaving as an ideal gas? Should be, right? Air is fairly ideal most of the time. Here's a trick. Here's a nice little trick you want to mark down somewhere. Density is the same thing as mass per volume. And if the air is behaving as an ideal gas, then PV equals MRT. Notice we have M and V in here. So I bet we can get density out of it. In fact, if I solve for M over V from the ideal gas law, what you'll get is P over RT. So the nice little trick is that rho, the density of an ideal gas, is P over RT. You should write this down somewhere very handy. This is very, very useful. This is only good for an ideal gas, but it's awful handy to have around. So why don't we go ahead and just calculate the density of the incoming air, and then we can calculate the mass flow rate. So the pressure of the air is 95 kilopascals. The gas constant for air, does anyone have that memorized in metric units? Probably not, but you will before the end of the class. It's 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Assuming I have it memorized correctly, we may want to go and find out. 
So how would you find out? You look for it in the back of your book. So you look at the first appendix, first page, and look up the gas constant. Notice we're in metric units, so it is, in fact, the first appendix. Do you have a page there, Mr. Jagger? It's 842. 842. So go to page 842. You should find this gas constant R there. Are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing good. We're still on 19 minutes. 287 there. Okay, so 2870. And then the temperature. Now be careful. The temperature they gave us was 20 degrees Celsius. Is that good enough? Can I just plug in 20 Celsius here? No, you have to be careful. Remember, the, it has to be in Kelvin. It has to be an absolute temperature. So 273 is the conversion, plus 20 is 293. So 293 Kelvin. Now, what about the units over here? This doesn't look like the units of density to me. I'd like to see kilograms per cubic meter. So what is a kilopascal? Or better yet, what's a kilojoule? Good, a kilopascal multiplied by a cubic meter. That's what a kilojoule is. So let's get rid of the kilopascals, and sure enough, we have kilograms per cubic meter. So it works out. All right, so if you plug all this in, you'll find that the density of the air is, uh, well, shoot, I didn't plug it all in. So please, grab your calculator. I use that as an intermediate, so I don't know the density. 1.13. 1.13? Thanks. So 1.13 cubic meters per kilogram. Everybody agree with that number? Yep. Yeah. So there's our density, and that came from, from right here. And we're going to multiply that by the volume flow rate of 0.8 cubic meters per second. So 0 0.8 cubic meters per second. I've got a problem because uh, it should be kilograms per cubic meter. Mm -hmm. I messed up. Yeah, that's, that's, what, you should have. Have. that's what I should have. Yeah, this is fine. I just Copy. didn't write it down right. Okay, so the cubic meters go away. Now I do have this result. The mass flow rate that I came up with on the cold side, you know what? Let's just do it this way. That should go in here next. That's what we were doing it for. The mass flow rate is 0 0.9038. Yeah. kilograms per second. Okay. So sounds like, sound like a better agree on that. That's good. Now the capacity, the heat capacity on this side is 1,005 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. To me it looks like this is going to be a real fancy way of writing about 1,000. Okay. So there's the heat capacity on the cold side multiplied by the, the mass flow rate should give us the capacity rate on the cold side. Can I get rid of this right here? Is that okay? All right, let's get rid of some of this. Okay, so when you plug this into your calculator, you should get a capacity rate. Actually, it's more like 908.3 watts per degree Celsius. Notice the joules and the seconds go together to form a watt. That's all I did here. So finally, now we've got the capacity rate on the cold side. We'll make a note of it over here, 908.3 watts per degree Celsius. So now, finally, we should be able to use this equation, basically Q dot equals the capacity rate on the cold side times the temperature change on the cold side to come up with that temperature change, All right? So, and better yet, we can even calculate the exiting temperature, but I'll go ahead and do what I said. I'll calculate the temperature change on the cold side. That should be equal to the heat transfer rate, Q dot, divided by the capacity rate on the cold side. We calculated Q dot, it's 102.850 watts, divided by the capacity rate, which is 908.3 watts per degree Celsius. The watts go away. And tell me what the temperature change is of the air on the cold side. So 102,850 over 908.3 is what? Well. 113.2. 113.2 degrees Celsius of change. So if the air comes in at 20 degrees Celsius, what temperature does it leave at? 133.2. So all you got to do is add the 113.2 of change to the 20 you'll have 133.2 degrees Celsius. Now I wrote that temperature in blue because this is the actual performance of our heat exchanger. Okay. And I'm just going to make a note in blue as well that Q dot is 
102,850 watts because all these numbers in blue are just the actual performance that was given. This is not the problem that our authors intended for us to solve. Okay, this is the actual performance of this heat exchanger. What they wanted us to do was use the log mean, excuse me, the effectiveness number of transfer units method with the UA product to figure out what the exit temperature should be, okay? And what the heat transfer rate should be. So basically, if we had the effectiveness, we should be able to get the heat transfer rate as effectiveness multiplied by maximum heat transfer rate. So let's get the maximum heat transfer rate because that's not too bad. The maximum heat transfer rate is C min, temperature of the hot stream in less temperature of the cold stream in, right? C min, well, which one has the lower capacity rate? Well, this time it's the cold side. Okay. So the capacity rate on the cold side is 908, whereas it's 1210 on the hot side. So 908.3 watts per degree Celsius multiplied by the temperature of the hot stream in 180 less the temperature of the cold stream in 20 degrees Celsius. So calculate this out if you would, please. Yeah, 145,000. So 145,000 watts or so would be the maximum heat transfer rate. And now you're probably looking at this and saying, well, why are we trying to calculate Q dot when we already have it? Well, this is going to be based on, what we're doing here is going to be based on this UA product. And it will predict the exit temperatures. Okay? Now, my suspicion, as I said, is that the heat exchanger is outperforming its specifications. So let's find out for sure. Now, last thing, we need this effectiveness. How can we come up with the effectiveness? Well, we could use the figures, if we wanted to, which are on page uh, 730, and probably we should start there, right? Because that'll give us a number, or give us a ballpark number, but then we should use the actual equations in order to make sure it's correct. So to use the figure or the equations, we'll need the capacity ratio, and we'll need the number of transfer units. But coming up with these two things are pretty easy. This is C min over C max. C min is 908.3, C max is 1210. So when you take that ratio, uh, the capacity ratio comes out to about 0.7507. Okay, there's our capacity ratio. The number of transfer units is UA over C min. Now the UA product was given as 1200 watts per degree Celsius. C min is 908.3. Uh, watts per degree Celsius. Notice the, the units go away. So the number of transfer units comes out to about 1.3211. Both the capacity ratio and the number of transfer units are dimensionless. Okay? Questions? We're doing okay? I'm going kind of fast because I'm running out of video time. Alright, so now let's go to the charts and look up the effectiveness. Now which chart should we be on? We're on page 730. What chart should we use? Basically, our choice is E or F, right? Because this is a cross-flow heat exchanger. For, so for the sake of the video, I'm going to point this out. The figure for both fluids unmixed is E. For one fluid mixed, the other one unmixed, it's F. Since both of our fluids are unmixed, we must be at E. Okay? So now, look on the x-axis at the number of transfer units equals 1.3211. Yeah, right. How about 1.3 or so? <laughs> Okay, one and a half is between one and two. 1 1.3 is going to be the, to the left of one and a half. Go up to the curve of 75% or so. It's about the best we can do. And read off the effectiveness. What number do you see there? 50. I thought I got about 60%. Let me, let me try. 1.5 to the left. Go up 0.75. Somewhere below 60%. Maybe 55%. Does that seem reasonable? 57. Okay. That's fine. I'm not picky. So to me, it looks like the effectiveness ought to be about 57%, okay? Now, how do we calculate? Well, you go back one page, page 729, and you try to figure out which equation to use. Now, obviously, it's not one or two, because it's not a double pipe or a shell and tube, right? So we're on page 729, looking at table 13.4. 
It's a cross flow heat exchanger, so that's under section three. Single pass, both fluids unmixed. Yep, both fluids unmixed. So that's the equation that I had you correct, remember? Okay, because there was a, a bracket missing. For those of you on the video, here it is. So there's a bracket making, missing on the right that goes after the one. But that's the equation we need to use. So guess what? We get the fun of typing this into our calculators. Uh, one minus, and I'll plug in numbers as we go, E to the power of the number of transfer units. Well, that's 1.3211, which itself has to be raised to the 0.22 power, divided by the capacity ratio, 0.7507. Uh, let's see, multiplied by E, another exponent, E to the power of... Uh, let's see, make sure I get this right. Uh, negative C, 0 0.7507, uh, multiplied by the number of transfer units, 1.3211, which has to be raised to the 0.78 power. Looks to me like they just made this up at random. 0 0.78 plus the 0 0.22 adds to 1. There must be a reason for that, but I honestly don't know what it is. And then we have to subtract off 1. Now, the 1 gets subtracted from E to the power of whatever. Okay, to make the uh, square brackets match, I guess I could do it this way. That way it matches what's in your book. And then, uh, really, this is a curly bracket. Does that look like fun to type into your calculator? Especially under the stress of an exam? Okay, so please download that spreadsheet I made for you because it does all this for you. I've already verified that they are correct. Okay, the number you would get from this would be the effectiveness. And the number I got when I plugged this into my spreadsheet was 0 0.5764. So I think that Mr. Caulfield's eye was pretty darn good on that one, 57%. Good job. So the number we get that's a little more accurate is 0.5764. Okay, what is that? That's this effectiveness. We've just found the effectiveness. So the actual heat transfer rate would be 0 0.5764. 764 multiplied by Q dot max, which was right here, 145,328 watts. When you plug that into your calculator, you find that the heat transfer rate uh, is 83,767 watts. This is the answer that your authors were trying to get you to find. Okay? We still have six minutes, we're doing good. But the actual heat transfer rate is about 102,000. Why the difference? Did we do something wrong over here? As I said, notice that this heat transfer rate is based on the UA product, okay, which is the size of the heat exchanger that the manufacturer tells us. The manufacturer is underrepresenting their heat exchanger, so we'll be happy with it. Right? Now, these exhaust gases, well, what's happening here? Well, air is coming in for combustion, right? It goes into some burner and comes back out right there. If you notice, the mass flow rate between these two, where was our other mass flow rate? We ended up finding it, didn't we? The mass flow rate on the cold side was 0.9038. I didn't write it down, but that's what we found. Mass flow rate on the cold side was 0 0.9038 kilograms per second. That's not a big difference from 1.1. Probably more than I would expect, but there's going to be a little bit of burned stuff come out here, right? If this is, if we're burning natural gas, if we're burning coal or whatever it is that's being burnt, the mass flow rate of the exhaust is going to be a little higher than the mass flow rate of the air coming in, because the air is not the only thing coming in to, to burn, right? So after the air burns whatever fuel it is and comes back out, well then we may as well reclaim some of that thermal energy coming in with the air, and that's what this is doing. Right? So anyway, we would expect there to be ash or some kind of junk in the exhaust that's going to foul up the heat exchanger over time. My guess is that this specification is to include the effects of fouling over a long period of time. And that way we know that our heat exchanger will do at least this good. When it's new, it does this, okay? Because it has a little bit more capacity when it's new. Right. So now let's calculate the, the predicted exiting temperatures with this heat transfer rate. Okay, so let's do that quickly. That should be easy. In fact, the equation is almost like what we've got there. Um, let me just let me just write it again. 
So basically, the heat transfer rate on the cold side would be the capacity rate on the cold side times the temperature. Uh, let me get this straight. I want a positive number. So temperature on the cold side out, less temperature of the cold side in. Okay, so the temperature of the cold side out, if we solve for it from this equation, would be the heat transfer rate over the capacity rate on the cold side plus the temperature of the cold stream coming in. So Q dot, then we're going to use this, right? Because we're trying to predict the actual temperature on the cold side. So that would be 83,767 watts. Capacity rate on the cold side, 908.3 watts per degree Celsius. The watts go away. Plus the temperature of the cold stream in, 20 degrees Celsius. So you tell me, how hot would the air come out once the heat exchangers fell? Okay, so it should be 112.2 degrees Celsius. How about this side? Well, we can write a similar equation, and I'm running out of video time, so I'll just write down the equation. The temperature of the hot stream out should be equal to Q dot over the capacity rate on the hot side. I'm sorry. Should be equal to the temperature of the hot stream in minus the heat transfer rate Q dot over the capacity rate of the hot side. So this would be 180 degrees less 83,767 watts divided by the capacity rate on the hot side, 1210 watts per degree Celsius. Okay, so throw that into your calculators, please. And tell me what you get. 110.7. Thank you. So this should be 110.7. But obviously our heat exchanger is doing better than predicted because it's new. Any questions? We made it. The video just ran out. <laughs>